Best Book Bits podcast brings you Nick Shaw, CEO and co-founder of RP Strength, co-host of RP Strength podcast and author of Fit for Success. Nick, thanks for being on the show. Well, thanks so much for having me on, man. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, happy to chat. I love chatting about all this stuff. Yeah, perfect. So for my audience that uh, don't know who you are, uh, where in the world do you come from and uh, how did you start your journey on where you are today? Yeah, so grew up in the U.S., actually born and raised in the state of Michigan, Uh, went to college at the University of Michigan and later moved out to New York City where I was a personal trainer for a bit. And that's kind of where I got started in the fitness industry and that morphed over time into uh, RP Strength, Renaissance Periodization. And I've been doing that for about a decade now. It seems really crazy to say, but... uh, I guess time flies when you're having fun. That's the that's the real short answer of it. But uh, I've always been into fitness, honestly, ever since I was a teenager and kind of realized early on that even though I wasn't super talented, if I worked really hard, I could you know keep up with the people that were more talented and kind of just took that concept of, hey, if you do X, Y, Z, you get outcomes, you know, A, B, C or whatever that is. Uh, basically saying that the the more work you put in, the harder you work, the more disciplined you are, things like that. If people are not as disciplined, even though they might be more skilled, more talented, whatever, whatever, you can hold your own. And so I've just, I I don't know, luckily, I think I was fortunate to realize that at a pretty early age. And that's what led me into fitness, because here's the cool thing about fitness. You can always lift more weight. You can always do more reps. You can always run a little faster. You know, there's always something more to be done. You can always get better. And then, so I love fitness, got into fitness, and that led into, you know, starting my own business. Well, lo and behold, the same principles from fitness apply to business and obviously a lot more things in life too. But, you know, really, if you just stay disciplined and all this stuff, like work really hard over time, you're probably going to have pretty good outcomes. And so I think that's a cool part of how there's lessons to be learned from one area of life. And they can really easily apply to other areas like that for me was uh, kind of this light bulb in my head that, uh, you know, eventually led to the, the book Fit for Success. But I just think that's really cool. Kind of the same principles to be successful in one area are the same where you'll be successful in another area. I think that's a good sort of segue to, to go back to your younger years. And I don't think you're, the first moment you sort of went into the gym and lifting some weights would realize that the disciplines and principles you're putting in to the gym at an early uh, career in your life would actually manifest into what you've done at the moment. Um, take us back to what what was the reasons for hitting the gym early? Was it for college football? Obviously, with the reason to getting fit, but was there any other sports that you participated in? Funny enough, I was a runner. So I was actually a distance runner. And so, okay. it, you know, it seems really counterintuitive. You know, people look at me now because I'm lifting or whatever. I was, you know, 50, 60, 70 pounds ago. But uh, there's actually a really funny story from my freshman year as a cross-country runner. I think we had nine people on the team and the top seven were varsity. I was not varsity my freshman year. So freshman year ends and we go into summer training and the coach is like, hey, you need to run 100 miles. So if people are listening in Australia, let's just call it 50 kilometers. It's, you know, maybe close enough, right? Uh, But like no one on the team did that. I was the only person that did. And then the first day of practice, my sophomore year, I'm beating essentially everyone from the year before. And I'm just like, what is going on? I'm like, this is crazy. I went from like one of the worst to, you know, running with the top guys. And so again, that was that light bulb for me that went off, oh, well, if I just do what I'm supposed to do, if other people don't do that, I'm going to have pretty cool outcomes. So again, that it, that was just just huge life lesson that I learned. And honestly, it just it got me hooked. And I was hooked on just training and getting better and pushing myself. And I loved it. I just I love the idea of getting better. You can always get better. And again, you know, take those same philosophies and then start applying them to other areas business, personal finances, et cetera, et cetera. It's really cool. When was the moment you sort of stopped lifting weights for fun and enjoyment and actually start looking at yourself as an athlete or a professional athlete and wanting to get on stage with, with bodybuilding? Because uh, I've done some research, I've seen some photos, and man, you did look uh, quite fit back in the day. And I'll, I'll put some photos and images on this video right now for people to see. But talk to me about that uh, experience on when the mindset changed and when did you get into professional bodybuilding and powerlifting? Yeah, uh, well... I, I almost went to college to be a runner. Um, 
I talked to the track coach at the University of Michigan and he was like, uh, your times were like pretty average. He's like, you probably don't have a chance to, you know, even walk on the team. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Well, th- you know, thanks for the brutal honesty. And so actually this is a funny story, but I met uh, the co-founder of RP in the college weight room at the University of Michigan. And he was like, hey, you seem like you're really into lifting. Come join our powerlifting club. And that was it. You know, that was the day because I was hooked. I needed, I loved competing in some aspect. You know, I wasn't competing and running anymore. Now I could start competing in powerlifting and bodybuilding. And so I was hooked. I was hooked from day one. Uh, my buddy was a great coach. He ended up coaching me to my first ever bodybuilding show in 2008. And I was hooked. I just, I was hooked. I loved the whole idea, the concept, everything behind it. And just dove in right into the deep end, so to speak, and was just immersed in bodybuilding, powerlifting for, you know, a good five, six, seven years, maybe even longer, something like that, uh, until I had a couple of kids. And then I sort of backed off uh, doing it as competitively and kind of realized that, you know, hey, maybe trying to run a successful business is going to be more worthwhile than, uh, you know, competing in uh, basically what was a hobby. So. Yeah, absolutely. When when did you know that from being an athlete to starting the business, when when did you transfer that um, into a business and how did the business start? And who was the business partner? Was that Dr. Mike? Is, is that correct? Yeah, Dr. Mike Israel. So again, we met at a yep. uh, weight room at the University of Michigan. He's like, hey, you need to do this. And we just, man, we just, we clicked. And uh, when he graduated, he was a couple years ahead of me. Uh, when I graduated, he's like, hey, I'm, I'm moving out to New York City to be a personal trainer. They need more trainers. You should come out. And I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. I'm graduating college. I'm whatever, 21. I'm like, cool, New York City. I get to do fitness stuff for a living. I'm like, yeah, I'm all about it. And that's where I started. We started training people. And that kind of led into uh, working with some folks online. And that was kind of this other light bulb moment in my head where I go, oh, I'm busting my tail going all over New York City, running around everywhere, up and down subway stairs, all that. What if I could do this online? It's a bit more efficient. Now my time is much more scalable, efficient, all that good stuff. And again, that was 2011, 2012. And that was really the beginning of RP. And uh, what do you do online? I know it's a multi-million dollar health and fitness uh, company, uh, improving the lives of hundreds of thousands of clients. But what exactly would it be if I went uh, to your company website? What am I going to learn? Like what's on there? Yeah, you're going to learn evidence-based practices for getting leaner, losing fat, losing body fats, uh, gaining a little bit of muscle, improving your sport performance if you want. And the cool part was we I, I kind of took this model of myself training someone one-on-one which is not a very good use of my time to doing online coaching. Well, even online coaching isn't super scalable. I mean, nowadays, I think we have 27 or 28 coaches that work for our piece, so it's a bit more scalable. But we created an ebook, so we created a digital product in October of 2014. And you want to talk about light bulb moments. That was kind of this like third light bulb moment. And it goes, oh, wow. Okay, instead of working with maybe a couple hundred people, if we create these digital products, they can reach a couple thousand people very quickly. And so that's where we, we took this idea of one-on-one coaching, nutrition coaching and training. And we, we built these uh, digital products called diet templates. My buddy Mike made them. And they were pretty successful. This is in February, 2015. It allowed us to go from working with a few hundred, maybe even a couple thousand people, like eBooks or something, to these digital products. There's no issue behind if you sell 10,000, 100,000, or a million. And so that was the really cool part. So now we've been able to help you know hundreds of thousands of people all over the world instead of you know just being limited to you know a couple hundred people if they're just doing one-on-one coaching. Yeah, absolutely. And and myself coming from an education background, I run the world's largest free book summary website, but uh, also doing eBooks as well. So it's a, it is a game changer. And one of the reasons why we got connected as well, I found you through JPS uh, Health and Fitness down in Melbourne, Australia with Jacob and Samuel. They do a lot of online um, education seminars and products too. Great YouTube channel. And I've done some training with uh, some of their programs called 10 Weeks to Lean. And I've done it three times, lost 10 kilos and put on 11 kilos after the program finished because I didn't change my habits but that's okay uh so totally agree with the online products on uh digital training and and ebooks as well um talk to me about sort of nutrition supplements uh does the average gym user need supplements or is that more for elite athletes like your bodybuilders and your powerlifters 
Yeah, it's a really good question. So you certainly don't need them. You know, here's the thing. So when we talk about priority, supplements are the, the lowest on the priority list, but they're so dang convenient that let's be honest, real life, you got kids, you got work, you have a hundred different things going on. It's just a lot easier to grab a protein shake or a protein bar and, you know, eat that on the go, maybe you're in the car or whatever, versus sitting down and having to take, you know, 10, 15 minutes to eat a meal. So you don't need them by any means, but they're just so convenient that for it just, it bumps it up for a lot of people. It's like, oh, hey, well, I'm just going to grab this because it's so much more convenient and easy. So... You don't need them, but it just makes things easier. So it's hard to really argue against them. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Now talk to me a little bit about RP's rise from going from a small business to sort of an influential tech company um, and and creating the app that you've got. So what was that like and and, uh, how can people uh, find the app and use it? Yeah, so I like to say, uh, you know, we, we we failed well to get from where we went from you know, not even having digital products to an ebook that was really ugly when it came out in 2014. Like looking back, we kind of laugh at it. We now have version 2.0 out, so it's you know a little bit nicer. But we created these ugly Excel templates, and it was kind of like just proving the model, just proving the concept, rather than spending hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of you know startup funds, whatever, to build an app, because software development takes a ton of time and money. We prove the concept. Do people want something like this? Yes. They did. They worked. Above all else, what we want to do is have products that work. And then people can get results. People are going to talk about them online. It's going to naturally spread. So we went from kind of version 1.0 of the templates to, all right, we got them out there, we proved the concept, made tons of mistakes. Okay, great. Now we're going to learn what are the mistakes that we made. Boom, iterate version 2.0. Still tons of mistakes. Still not very good looking. Okay, now we're going to iterate again. Ah, now we have something that at least looks pretty nice. It's like a nice, colorful, pretty PDF. But again, it's not really interactive. It's just a static you know, document, more or less. So we kind of always knew that we wanted to shift towards an app. But, you know, when you're completely bootstrapped from day one, you can't really just dive into that. So we kind of just failed early, failed often, failed small to kind of just build up over time. Again, you know, digital products allowed us to kind of build on the back end, learn everything, uh, basically raise our own internal capital to now go out and start building our own apps. You know, here we are late 2018, early 2019, we came out with this app. And now again, we just keep iterating. We just get it out there. We learn what people like. Cool. People like X, Y, Z. Now people want these three new features. Cool. Now we know that's on the list and we just keep doing that. So a couple years later, our app's fundamentally different than it was a couple years ago. We just keep building on that. Just keep building on that. What does that sound like? Well, it sounds a lot to me like fitness, right? You start somewhere. Maybe you're in shape. Maybe you're not. You just get a little bit better. All right. All right. What area now needs to be worked on more? Great. Uh, arms, abs, whatever it is. Right. Okay. Now we do that. We get a little bit better. We get a little bit better. We get a little bit better. So again, I think it goes back to what we first started with. You take those fitness concepts, now apply them to business. Hey, they're the same things. They're the same fundamental principles. Yep. I want. I want to talk uh, a little bit about evidence-based. Uh, nutrition, but what you just said then was basically like a feedback loop with evidence-based customers. Customers will tell you what they hate and what they like, and if you listen to your customers, you can fail forward, but failing forward is the way to success. Um, You're not falling down the stairs, you're actually climbing the stairs uh, through feedback, but for people on this podcast listening to this or watching this, and they're not into fitness or nutrition, haven't done a lot of research. I've done an eight-page an eight-page video series on the basics of nutrition, and I'm not a nutritionist or, or a coach or anything. But talk to me about evidence-based uh, nutrition 101 for people out there that don't know what it is. Sure. So you can find any study out there that's going to tell you just about anything. So you got to be really careful when you go look at the evidence if you only look at one particular study. So what you want to do is you want to look at the collective body of evidence, the collective body of literature that's out there. So you want to look at literature reviews. You want to look at meta analyses. And these are collections of, you know, potentially hundreds, if not thousands of studies, something like that. Those start to point you in the right direction as to what actually works. And so that's where we want to spend most of our time, most of our resources, because it's more likely to be on the right track. So that's what we're after. That's pretty much what we do. Because if you go on Google right now and Google, what's the best way to lose fat? You're going to get 10 bazillion results, probably 10 bazillion different ways that people are telling you. 
So it's really confusing for people. Imagine if you or I, I mean, I don't, maybe you know stuff about cars, I certainly don't, but imagine if I went to 10 different mechanics to get my engine fixed and every single one told me something different. I have no clue who, who was right. So when I look at that from that perspective, when people don't know anything about fitness, it's super confusing. So our job is to just break through all that BS out there and think, hey, you know what? We know you've tried a hundred different things. Here's what really works. Here's a simple and straightforward plan. Just follow this. This is your blueprint on the road to success. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, there's, um, as you call it, bazillion. There are a bazillion influences out there, people that might have great genetics naturally, um, can ease, and they're full-time jobs. So for example, one of my pet peeves is personal trainers and coaches who work in a gym. Yeah, they're gonna have a great body, yeah, they do it full time, but your average person like myself that works in an office, works in a studio, sits down all day, has a family, two kids, uh, very, very busy, is never gonna be in an elite athlete shape. Now, what are some of the things you would recommend for people that don't go to the gym? Obviously, during COVID, gyms are being closed, which we can touch on that as well, but what are some of the sort of three principles or advice you would give people to maintain their fitness and physique uh, without going to the gym? What are some of the top three tips you would give people? Sure. You can work out at home. You don't even need really like heavy weights. You, if you got a pair of dumbbells at home, you can get in some really good workouts, 20, 30 minutes a day. Most people can find 20, 30 minutes a day. Now, does that mean you're gonna have to go pretty hard in those 20, 30 minutes? Sure. But you don't need to do this crazy elaborate stuff if, if your schedule doesn't allow it. Right, because at the end of the day, we want people to stick to this over the long term. So if we're like, hey, you know, Jim, yeah, I know you, you know, work 80 hours a week and you have three kids and you know your family depends on you, but yeah, you know, you have to go to the gym for two hours a day. That's terrible advice because it's just never going to be practical for them. But instead, we're like, hey, Jim, three times a week, I want you to lift weights at home. You know, those dumbbells you have. Hey, here's what you're going to do. Boom, 20, 30 minutes. That's it. Okay, nutrition side. Let's keep it simple. Try to eat mostly healthy foods. Just cut back a little bit on the junk foods. Also, I'll go even one further. So yeah. train with weights a couple times a week. It doesn't have to be in a gym. It can be at home. Ditch some of the junk food. Most people know what that means. Uh, you know, if it's ditch some of the fast food, ditch some of the you know, donuts, cookies, things like that. The soda, probably that's a good one to cut out. Uh, and number three, try to get some lean proteins in every single meal. And if you do that, you're going to be a little bit less hungry. So those urges and cravings that you have to go eat those really delicious, you know, donuts, cakes, pizza, things like that, those things that just taste really, really good, you're less likely to want those because you're eating lean protein, it's a bit more filling. Those are some just real basic, quick things I would recommend for pretty much anyone. Yeah, perfect. So uh, uh, light weights at home, cut out the junk food and get some lean protein in. Perfect, perfect. Now, you've personally coached uh, elite athletes, you know, world-class athletes, CrossFit, uh, people from champions, international weightlifters, UFC fighters, Navy SEALs and Olympians. What are the sort of top characteristics um, of those people that are different than the average people as well? What's some of the mindset uh, things that you can sort of nitpick and what makes them different in as an expert. Yeah, work ethic. Yeah, work ethic. Yeah, if people don't understand, like these folks are in the gym three, four, five hours a day, pretty much every single day. It, it, it literally is their life. It's how they make a living, so it's what they do. You go to the office for eight hours a day, you know, I set a computer six, eight hours a day. Their job is training. So, okay, if you train two hours a day, that's a lot. But there's a difference between being pretty good being very good, being excellent, and then being elite, the top of the top. People just don't understand that kind of exponential jump that it takes to get all the way up to the top. So that's number one. Number two really is I think, and it kind of goes hand in hand with work ethic, is really just discipline. So I've had a chance to interview a lot of these same folks and I'm just like, what do you do on the days you don't want to be there? And sure. they're like, oh yeah, yes, exactly. Yep, that's pretty much verbatim what they said. Just one step, one step forward. Just get in there. You feel like crap or whatever, but hey, you've got some. You got something programmed in there that you need to do. Just start warming up. Start stretching. Like you're probably going to start feeling better. Get some endorphins going. Blood flow going. You're going to feel a little bit better. And then lo and behold, an hour or two, you're into it. You're like, hey, I feel pretty good. 
This is a good idea. That's just what they do. They just show up and they just keep showing up. I think that's a good segue into your book, uh, Fit for Success, that you uh, published in November of 2020. What was the motivation to to write the book and put all your knowledge uh, into it? So how did that start and, and come about? Yeah, so my family had a pretty crappy start to 2020. Uh, a couple of days before my son's eighth birthday, my wife was diagnosed with uh, aggressive form of breast cancer. So it's bad on its own. She has surgery. And then in March 2020, she starts chemo. I went with her to the first session. And then I think we all know what happened in March 2020. Later on, COVID hit. Literally, the world kind of shut down. Unheard of, unprecedented in our lifetime. So we kind of had all these things hit us in a matter of two months, more or less. And it would have been really, really easy to just kind of play the, you know, the victim card. What was me? Just, you know, hey, we're just down on our luck. Oh, this, you know. But we didn't do that. And it kind of just, you know, all these little things I've been reading about and I had been learning because I love reading. I just, you know, I thought about, you know, what, what, all right, what are some things I can take away from these books? You know, whether it's stoicism, whether it's reading about personal finances, business, marketing, whatever it is. But like, there's these this little clues of success here and there. And I started to pick up on them and I started to compile them down into this list. And then everything in 2020 happened. And it really just made me take a step back and be like, okay, I know these are kind of the things that I need to do to be successful. These same things are going to be what my family needs to do now to get through this really crazy, crappy time. And so it's one thing to think about them and, you know, kind of you know, meditate on them, so to speak. But it's entirely different when you have to truly live it every single day. And for me, that was just, just this other eye opener. And I was like, Man, with everything going on in 2020, I think this is going to be something really valuable for people to take away because every person was impacted in 2020 by COVID. Like, I don't care who you are. It impacted everyone. And so if there's some maybe lessons that, that helped me, almost certainly they can help other people. And, you know, that's why I wanted to get it out before 2020 was over because I just, I, I, I knew that it could help people. And how's your wife going now? Is um, has she started treatment? Is, is she okay or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's she's doing great. She's actually been um, she's she's been down with chemo for like over a year now. Um, she finished uh, radiation last like uh, August, which you know coming up on a year. And so yeah, she's doing great, man. Uh, you know, knock on wood, uh, she's doing very well. I'd say you know she's back to 98 percent. So thank you for asking. Yeah, no problem at all. And in your book, you talk about sort of the seven fundamental habits for for achievement to help anyone. Um, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I am. But what are those seven sort of fundamental habits? So I'm not sure you've got the book on handy there to, to look at. But give us a run through of sort of the outline of, of what's in the book. And I do encourage my readers to go out there and buy the book, uh, Fit for Success by Nick Shaw. But talk to me, Nick. Yeah, so the first one's work ethic. Ironically, it's the shortest chapter in the book because yep. – how much can really be said about work ethic? But here's a big takeaway on work ethic. You can have all the ideas in the world, but if you don't act on them, if you don't do anything, it doesn't matter. It means nothing. You get nothing. There's no outcome. So that's why it's really important. Number two, internal locus of control. Sounds like a funny term. Most people have not heard of that, but everyone knows what it means. You focus on the things you actually have control over. And when you do that, you'll have much better outcomes. We don't focus on the things that we have no control over. That's just a worthwhile, worthless endeavor. Number three, positive mindset. What do successful people tend to do? They tend to be a lot more positive, a lot more optimistic. And they tend to be a lot more hopeful because they know that the things they do actually matter and will impact their outcomes. Number four is discipline. I already talked a little bit about that. Number five is your purpose and meaning. That's really going to help those, those you know, days where you don't feel like doing it. It's going to make discipline just a little, just a hair easier when you just really love what you're doing and have that purpose and meaning behind it. Six, it's all about failure. Talked a little bit about that, but failure is huge. You can't be scared of failure. Any successful person is going to tell you they've failed more times than they can count on you know, all their fingers and toes and probably all their bones combined. It's just part of it. But the key is, like you said, you kind of fail forward. You learn from it. You don't keep making those mistakes. And then at the very tip, this is all hard. So what do you do? The very tip is, is recharge. You know, you Recharge. can't, yep. it, as an entrepreneur, you can't just go, 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 go 24 seven. I mean, I've kind of tried that before for quite a while. And, you know, my, my wife and I were close to burnout in 2015, 2016 from just 
go, 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 you know, doing everything ourselves. So you gotta, you gotta be able to kind of take that step back and kind of see things from, you know, one level up and it's probably going to help you make some better choices because you're not kind of in that fire, so to speak. Yeah, perfect. And just to recap, I know you've done a, what they call the success pyramid on it uh, with the um, with the seven chapters. I've actually written a book called Success in 50 Steps and six out of those seven chapters are actually chapters in my book, um, which is great. So I'll just go through them again. So work ethic, uh, internal locus of control, positive mindset, discipline, purpose, failure, and at the top of the pyramid, recharge, which goes back to. So if you... If, Talk to me about recharge, rest, and obviously with athletes as well. Um, I know professional bodybuilders, all they do is work out, eat, and rest. How important is sleep and rest, not just for athletes, but for the general population as well? It's not more important than I think people realize because especially as entrepreneurs, like that's just the best example, right? Because you don't, I, you know, as an athlete, you kind of know like, all right, I need to recover. I, you know, I need to do a pretty good job of recovering. But entrepreneurs, it, you know, almost don't seem to make that connection because there's it's almost glorified on social media that, yeah, you know, you just grind, 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 you know, just 24 seven around the clock. Now, listen, when you're first starting out, might you have to make some of those sacrifices and trade-offs? Yeah, totally. But you can't just keep doing it over and over. You just, you gotta be able to take a little bit off the gas pedal and, and step back because what happens, I always like to tell people, what happens if you start a road trip and you only have a quarter tank of gas? How far are you getting? Run out. You're not, yeah, yeah, you're not getting very far. But I also will say most of the really top athletes, they know about periodization. Lo and behold, Renaissance Periodization is our company name. But you you kind of plan strategically when you need to back off, you know, when you can have some easier training times. And if you're an elite athlete, that's really what you want to look for. Yep. So that all circles back to, to recharge as well. So obviously being an, an elite athlete, and I know you've done uh, powerlifting as well, what is the major difference between bodybuilders and powerlifters in terms of training, nutrition, uh, for the average folk out there that, that don't know the difference between powerlifters and, and uh, bodybuilders? Cool. So two things. One, you've been so incredibly kind to me saying that I'm like, you know, good at lifting or whatever. It's, uh, it's probably a little bit uh, over the top. I do appreciate that though. Um, so bodybuilding, you're going to train, I think kind of uh, a little bit lighter weights, a little bit more reps, 10, 12 reps per set, something like that. These, this is very average. Uh, power lifters are going to be, you know, strength training. So, you know, maybe like one to three reps, three to five reps, something like that, because you just want to get stronger. Uh, on the nutrition side of things, bodybuilders have to get very, very lean to be on stage. So the extent to which they're going to cut their calories and do more cardio and things like that is pretty extreme because they have to look extreme on stage. It's not really about performance. It's just how they look. Powerlifting is kind of completely the opposite of that. It doesn't matter what you look like. It just matters how much you can lift on, on you know, on that day on the platform. So they're really much more performance focused and, you know, maybe a little bit more relaxed with their nutrition. Those are probably the main differences. Yeah, great. And uh, so I can put that in layman's terms to people. Some of my mentors, I've got two mentors in the bodybuilding and powerlifting space. On the bodybuilding space, everyone knows his name because everyone's seen him in movies. And I yes, I'm going to hold up the book. It's an old book that I've had. It is called The Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay, so that's number one. And the other one is Eddie Hall. Uh, a lot of people don't know who Eddie Hall is, but uh, who is Eddie Hall to you, Nick Shaw? Uh, well, strong man, better. Very, very big guy. Very, very strong guy. Yeah. Have you seen the documentary? Um, uh, is it Strong Man Eddie on Netflix or something like that? I haven't, but I probably need to. Yeah. You yeah. need to. So, yeah. Strong, strong men are uh, man. They are really, they're really impressive. Original Vikings. Um, yeah, I, yes. I used to watch Strong Man as a kid, and um, obviously I'm not a big guy myself, so. Um, I enjoy working out at the gym, uh, but I also uh, have a bad diet and enjoy eating out and drinking wine as well. But talk to me about dieting a little bit with fad diets. So I've gone through phases in my life, uh, as everyone's done with fad diets, and there's a lot of them. One is the the keto uh, by Mark Sisson. I've done a couple of book summaries on that. Um, also done one early in my days, another old book called uh, Fit for Life by um, Bill Phillips as well. But do fad diets, obviously they don't work, but are they really bad for your body to be intermittent sort of going on fad diets for 10 weeks and coming off? What, what are your thoughts or give us, some, give us some of your wisdom on that particular area in terms of fad diets? 
I love the idea of delayed gratification on longer term time horizons. Yep. A lot of people want to rush results. They think that here's the thing. It's a tricky, it's, it's a tricky thing. You get really motivated one day. You're just like, oh man, I really need to get in shape. I need to do it. I'm so ready. I'm so fired up. I'm so motivated that you want to rush things. But, and here's the cool thing, right? If we go back to all the different areas of life, does that work really anywhere? Like, can you rush success? Can you rush results? You, you can't can. rush kids. That's number one. Oh no, I'm going to segue a little bit, but you've got yeah. two kids, correct? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, you definitely oh, can't yeah. rush kids. You, you can't you rush can't, kids, but continue. Yeah. You can't, you know, you can't rush, you know, anything. You want to be super rich and wealthy? You can't rush that. You want to, you know, get lean? Ah, man, you can't really rush that unless you want to, you know, you go fast, 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 fast. Well, you're probably going to tumble back pretty quick too. So again, if you just extend your, your time horizon, right, extend it out, be a little bit more patient, Again, this isn't just fitness, it's pretty much everywhere. But if you do that, you're, you're gonna make better choices because you're not in a rush. You're probably not comparing your results to other people. You know, social media, hint, 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 don't do that. And you just, again, you make better choices. You know that the work you're doing now is going to pay off a little bit more in the long run. So you kind of see the bigger picture. And that's really the issue with fad diets. People just are chasing instant results overnight. And boy, I wish it worked like that, but it just doesn't. Yep. I guess that's the same for investing. I'm an investor in people and uh, startup companies as well. And at the end of the day, delaying gratification now for what they call slow cook success, it might take five, 10 years, but you will eventually get there. I agree 100%. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, who are your top sort of three mentors, whether they be people and books, could be from your early days that sort of started you on this track as well. So any good books out there that you recommend or people that uh, we should follow that maybe be a mentor of yours when you were young? Sure. I got, uh, I got three people top of mind. So uh, one of my favorite books I love to recommend to people is called The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. Yep. Just slow and steady results. You just keep doing the little things every day. And it seems like you're not doing much, but man year, three years, five years down the road, you keep doing those little things every day, you're going to be head and shoulders above where you are now. I love that idea. I love that concept. Um, number two, I actually, I'm a really big fan of Jocko Willink. So I think uh, Extreme Ownership is a really cool book. I just, I just love Navy SEALs again, because, you know, they're, they kind of have that same approach, that same mindset, you know, tend to be pretty humble in general. They're, you know, I happen to know a good number of SEALs and stuff and just really highly respect them, really look up to them. Uh, I love listening to his podcast because I'm a big, like, you know, military history nerd too. So I'm um, a big fan of that. I've learned a lot from them. Uh, actually, that's how I got started in training jujitsu. And um, I actually was just training jujitsu tonight before I got back to this podcast. Um, I was going to touch on that. Um, I was going to say, what do you do in your spare time apart from doing jujitsu? I lift, I work out, I read, I have two kids. So, you know, and you factor all that in, that's pretty much all my time. So outside of work. So, I was listening to uh, Jocko podcast yesterday and he did a little video on a little short clip. If you go to his YouTube channel, Jocko Wilnick, and the first trailer video, he talks about the word good. And I like the way he looks into the microphone and says, good. Woke up and you're feeling sick today? Good. Everything's good. So, yeah, big fan of Jocko. Who's the number three? Who's number three? Yeah, so, so so real quick. So what's that good? What's that good mindset? What is that? That's you know optimism. That's taking something bad, finding the good in it, right? And and again, like you know, I'm not comparing myself to anyone else, and I don't think I'm successful compared to any of these other people. But that's what I did. You know, 2020 hit. I'm like, all right, well, this happened. This is bad. Now I'm going to take it, and I want to make something good come of it. That's usually what successful people tend to do. Um, so number three is um, my buddy, Dr. Mike Isertel. He's uh, He's, man, not to get all sappy here, but he's taught me more than uh, he'll probably ever realize. So he's number yeah. three. Perfect. I just want to uh, take people to a fun place. So I was scrolling through your Instagram the other day and found a, a great little post you put up there. And I'll just read it out to the audience. Uh, it's uh, when patients tell me they're scared to lift weights uh, because they think they look like a pro bodybuilder. I tell them that's like being scared to drive because they think they'll become a NASCAR driver. Uh, great yeah. post. Yeah, it totally. Was, well, that's uh, actually uh, that's, uh, that's my buddy, Doctor Spencer Nadolski. Uh, he's uh, we kind of jokingly call him like the meme doctor. Um, you know, at, at uh, you know Dr. Nadolski, he, he's a really good follow. But yeah, it's it's you know, come on, right? That's like you know, you're scared of uh, investing in the you know whatever stock market because you think you're going to be you know a famous you know hedge fund guy. It's like come on, you know, 
it's just not how it works. Yeah, absolutely. Now, just a couple little myths. Um, I've heard a couple of quotes, obviously, over the years, but can you really out-train a bad diet? But you No, sorry, the quote is you can't train out-train a bad diet, but, but sort of can you have a bad diet, do a little bit of gym just to maintain sort of an average physique? Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, if you want average results, average physiques, if you work out really hard and, you know, maybe your diet's 60%, of the way there and the other 40% you just kind of have some fun. I think you can totally do that. I mean, some of that might be a little bit genetic based, you know, some people can probably get away with 20, 80. <laughs> yeah, Is it possible to have a, a dad bod in your thirties? Like I, I do at the moment. And then sort of when you get to forties, when the kids grow up a little bit, hit the gym a little bit harder and get your body back into your twenties. Is that possible to go from fit in your twenties dad bod in your thirties and back to fit in forties. Have you got results before with, with people going from dad bods to 40 year old bods that are pretty fit? Totally. Apply the slight edge principle, you know, it might not happen in a couple months, but if you really put in the work for, you know, a year or two, absolutely. I think there's no reason Perfect. you couldn't. Perfect. Yeah. That's sort of what I'm going for. I'm sort of just doing the, I've got two young kids. So I'm just sort of maintaining the physique. It's not a good physique, but it's not a bad physique, but mm -hmm. I do want to sort of um, focus on it and with the slide. So thank you for sharing that with me. Now, quick uh, little round robin question before we sort of wrap up, where are you going to be in five years time? What are you going to be working on? Where do you see your business going? Um, Nick Shaw in 2026, where will we see you? I don't know exactly where I'll be, but I know that uh, I'm going to keep applying the same principles that I try to do every single day. And that's, you know, reading a little bit each day, working out a little bit each day, just aiming to get a little bit better. So I don't know exactly where that's going to take me, but at the same time, I don't really care. It's kind of the mastery mindset. There's no real end result for me. I just love the process of getting better. So I'm just going to keep working and wherever that leads me, hey, you know, that's as long as I'm not where I'm at now and I can say that, hey, I'm probably better off. I'm, I'm good with that. Yeah, perfect. That's actually a test question I asked my um, my guest, and they all say the same thing. Falling in love yeah. with the process, they don't really care about where they're going to be. They just know what they're going to be doing, and, and that's serving people and, and serving yourself to the highest sort yeah. of level as well. Now, I sort of asked the question before in a roundabout way, but I'll ask it in a different way. If you were to host a dinner party with three people from famous from the past or present, who would they be, and what would you serve them? So three people from the past, who would they be? You know, for some reason, well, so especially now, because he's uh, unfortunately deceased, uh, Kobe Bryant would be one. Yep. Um, I feel like uh, being able to talk to someone like Albert Einstein would be incredibly fascinating. Uh, maybe number three, uh, you know, military history nerd, George Washington, first president Washington. of the U.S. Like, that's going to be a good one. What would I serve him? I would serve him a traditional boring RP meal, some lean protein, some, you know, fruits and veggies, uh, whole grains, and we'd just have a blast just chatting. It'd be a good conversation. Kobe, Einstein, George Washington. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. I like it. Sounds Done. really funny. Um, now, where can people find you online? I know you're sort of on Instagram a lot at RP Strength and RP underscore transformations, but is there anywhere else you sort of spend your time online? Yeah, on my personal page, uh, at nick.shaw.rp. And uh, yeah, if you want, you want to grab a copy of Fit for Success, it's on Amazon. You can get a paperback. Uh, Kindle's, you know, it's like super cheap. Uh, it's like under $5. And uh, oh, you can get it on Audible too. So I did the audio recording myself, which was a lot of fun. It was really interesting to do that. So. Oh, you did? Okay. I'm definitely going to uh, listen to that. Uh, that's amazing. So the book is called Fit, Six Fit for Success by Nick Shaw. Do you think you will write another one? What was the the process like on putting it all on paper? Would you do it, would you do it again? Uh, yeah, definitely would do it again. Um, I've kind of kicked around a couple ideas, but uh, yeah, I don't know if it would really be like a sequel or anything or just something completely different. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd almost kind of like a, like to write a parable, you know, just because I, I think just reading stories like that just is just and you can read books like that really, really quick. And I've you know, read a handful like that. And I just think they're really simple, easy to read. And honestly, you get the take home message pretty dang clear and something like that. So I've kind of kicked around that idea, but um, you know, it would probably be you know, maybe a couple of years. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm just going to give another short plug to the guys at JPS, a 24-page book, amazing, called A Simple Guide to Scientific Nutrition. I've actually done a video on it as well. But um, Nick, before you take off, what would be the last message you would share with my audience that are listening and watching this interview? What's, what's one message you would share? Be patient. You have to be patient. And I know that's not something that everyone wants to hear, but usually the things that we don't want to hear tend to be the most important things because it actually is what we really need to hear. And you just have to be patient because you're not going to rush your way to success. It just doesn't happen, whether that's fitness, business, building personal wealth, et cetera, et cetera. Things just take time and you just have to take it from that mindset and just approach it day by day. And listen, I find myself, I have to talk to myself every day about that because I've only been training jujitsu like maybe six, seven months. And I like see people that are black belts, but I'm like, and I really want to be there. But I'm like, they've been training for probably 10 plus years. So that would be like someone coming to me and being like, oh, hey, I want to bench press 500 pounds. How do I do that? And it's like, well, like you can bench 100 pounds now. So that's, you know, it's just, it's the same thing. It applies to everyone. We're all guilty of it. So it's something I remind myself all the time. Yeah, perfect. And Gary V sums it up and says macro patience, micro speed. And what you're saying is have patience to for decades but work today in those increments to make the progress yes. for those decades exactly yeah. so a conversation i literally just had with myself today was yeah. okay i know that eventually someday i want to be here okay that's great but what can i do today i can't put 10 years of progress into today so what can i do today i'm just going to show up to the class i'm going to do my best I'm going to try to learn one thing and I'm going to keep repeating that process. You know, not every, I don't go to class every single day. But again, you just keep applying that same thing. Lo and behold, over time, that leads to success. And man, it's really just not a sexy answer, but it's the right answer. It's truth. Yeah. Well, Nick, thanks for your time. Thanks for being on the show. For my audience, and uh, please go out and buy this book, Fit for Success by Nick Shaw. Thanks for being a guest on the Best Book Bits podcast. And uh, we'll chat soon. So thanks for being on the show, Nick. Thanks so much for having me on, man. I would be really interested in uh, checking out your book. Uh, I love reading just about success in general. And I'll send you a copy. Wow. No stress. Awesome. That would be fantastic, man. Thanks right. so much. Thanks so much. I'll speak to you soon. Okay. Cool. Yeah, have a good one.